Well, welcome and thanks again for attending this webinar on Penn State's demonstration of its award-winning closed captioning workflow. Before we begin, we'd like to do a quick sound check. Uh, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, uh, if you can hear me okay. Very good. So my name is Tol Kesson, and I'm one of the principals of 3Play Media. Also, I would like to introduce the other presenters. Dr. Keith Bailey is the Assistant Dean of Online Learning and Education Technology at the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State University. Keith has been involved in workforce training, instructional technology, and distance education for over 15 years. One of his areas of focus is to enhance learning through the integration of technology-based solutions. Brian Olendike is a lead developer and information architect at Penn State's University's College of Arts and Architecture. Brian focuses on the e-learning management system and the Drupal community at Penn State. And then Josh Miller is one of the founders of 3Play Media. This webinar will last about an hour. Keith will begin with an overview of ELI Media, which is the e-learning institute's media asset management system. Next, Brian Olendike will do a live demonstration of the system. Finally, Josh will talk about the closed captioning workflow and 3Play Media's involvement. That should take us about half an hour, and we'll save the rest of the time for your questions. The best way to ask questions is by typing them in the questions window in the bottom right corner of your control panel. Please feel free to type your questions anytime during the presentation. We'll keep track of them and address as many as possible at the end. Also, please note that this webinar will not have live captions. However, it is being recorded, and everyone will receive an email with, within 48 hours with a link to view the recorded version which will have closed captions as well as a searchable interactive transcript. Also, if you want to follow along, uh, the hashtag for this webinar is PSU3Play. That's PSU, the number three, and then play. Now, I'll hand things off to Keith Bailey from Penn State. Okay, well, thank you for that. I, uh, please let me know if, if I need to turn that up anymore. But um, we are here today really to talk about um, the innovative strategy that we put together to manage digital assets in, in online courseware. And so to, to kind of start to give you a sense a little bit about who we are as, as an e-learning institute within the College of Arts and Architecture, our primary goal really is to support the design and development of e-learning courses within the College of Arts and Architecture. That is actually made up of uh, seven disciplines within the college. And our primary role is to help support the design, development, and implementation of those courses for the college. Um, also, one of the primary goals is to stimulate uh, instructional technology innovation within the, within the college itself. Given the arts discipline, there are a lot of needs that uh, seem to be fairly unique to our discipline. And we've taken that challenge head on and uh, have developed some innovative tools to, to help uh, facilitate the learning, teaching and learning in, within the college. Now, to give you a sense of, of where we stand as a college, at currently we, there are about 39 online courses within the college. And you can see the various disciplines uh, listed here, as SOVA being the School of Visual Arts, uh, including fine art, landscape architecture, music, theater, art history, integrative arts, and architecture. Uh, we have approximately 30 some faculty that uh, have helped either develop courses and or teach courses. And our portfolio includes uh, well over 12,000 enrollments annually across the college and across the university. Uh, we do service a, a general education, general arts population within the college, uh, and that counts for a large majority of the enrollments at this point in time. So. Really, when, when we came about with the technology, one, one of the key goals that we, we've always found is that we really need to establish an infrastructure that is actually driven by instruction, an instructional philosophy. We found that it is very important to have this instructional philosophy and then tie the, the infrastructure to it um, and not just throw technology at, at uh, what we would perceive as a problem. So really the power and the goal is to empower faculty and designers to provide a state, stable, reliable, scalable, reusable technical infrastructure that ultimately improves the course design, delivery, and the reuse of those materials. So one of the goals of this then is, is one of the primary goals that we've come about was to keep our course content separate from the course communication. Really maintaining the content in a content management system 
allowing content management systems with what they do very well to manage the content and the delivery and the design of the courses, and then also allow the communication platforms, more of the LMSs of the world, to do what they do well. So we've done that, and that's been part of our philosophy, is to really keep this content separate from the communication. The second goal, then, was to actually extrapolate the content from the design itself. So given the fact that we were in an arts college, there was a very strong need to keep the visual design of our materials separate from the content and have unique looks for each of our course materials. As you can see here, this is a, one of our courses, a film music course. You can kind of see the theme that we put into place. And then we layered uh, the content into that using the content management system. And then what the student sees is, is actually down at the bottom of, of the screen there. So then, third, the goal of keeping the media separate from the content. Again, very important aspect of this, given the fact that we use public pieces of media, things in YouTube, things in Flickr, and other sources like Vimeo. We also use and embed a lot of purchased video. Um, since we are an arts college, we are very visually based, and we have a lot of media needs. So we follow each one of these three areas, uh, public, purchased, and then private. The private side is what we're actually going to be talking about today, and that helps us finalize goal three of keeping media separate from content and allowing us to store that media in a private location that then gets embedded into the content, which gets wrapped into the course uh, content interface. So if we start to look at some of the needs that really came about as a result of, uh, of this philosophy, we wanted to eliminate the duplication of media assets as courses are actually duplicated. We offer 39 courses and many sections of those courses. And current content management, the way that we would duplicate is we would duplicate an entire course and all of that media would go right along with it and we would end up duplicating media and it would become uh, an asset management nightmare, really. So we wanted to be able to eliminate the need for uh, duplication, store once, use many. Um, being able to allow for the reuse of these digital assets a lot across courses. Uh, many of the courses can utilize different pieces of media, say they're film clips from one uh, movie that can be used across different, different courses. Then also provide a mechanism really to embed the media into the courses with minimal effort. We have learning designers and faculty members developing the courses, and it became very cumbersome for them to be able to actually embed the media but, and also maintain um, the need to eliminate the duplication. In addition, simplifying the workflow of copyright and, and transcription, accessibility and compliancy with these areas became very critical to us. And we wanted to make sure that um, we were a compliant with copyright laws and also that uh, we could easily embed transcription code along with any audio and video file as, as we um, have developed it. So then to ensure online uh, course, courses meet copyright and compliancy of the media, that became a critical, uh, critical asset need or management need. And then finally, really to facilitate communication needs with the media production. We have um, a media development staff, an instructional design staff, and a technologist that we needed to be able to communicate the needs of these media pieces across all of these mechanisms and make sure that things are getting done efficiently and effectively and that things aren't being missed. So what we wanted the system to be able to accomplish that as well. So the solution was really to build what we're calling is the ELI media server. And this is really just an asset management system that is used to store images, video, audio files, flash files, basically anything that we would want to embed in a course that is not content. Um, we also have added in the feature of being able to manage copyright. So as things are uploaded, you have to put in the copyright information and classify it as per the terms of use of that piece of media. And that would then get embedded directly into the courses. Also, quick and easy uh, mechanism for being able to associate transcript files with the appropriate media assets. So the system will help merge those two things together. To end that, that um, we use a front end interface of Drupal, uh, and then the back end is a Flash media server. So the ELI media server is a combination of a Drupal front end and a Flash media back end. So some of the benefits we've actually seen of this system thus far 
is that uh, we are able to maintain compliancy very quickly and easily now, uh, thus requiring copyright information to be associated with the digital assets. We also we can classify them as, as to how we wish to use them. Are we classifying them under Teach Act? Are we classifying them under Creative Commons? If we've created it, we can classify it as Creative Commons a Creative Commons item, or we can classify it that what the Creative Commons license that came along with that asset, and that all gets stored right along with it. The other thing is, and this is where Three Play Media really comes into play, is the accessibility side of closed captioning. We now have a, a very streamlined workflow as to how we can uh, take the media files, upload them, get the transcribed files back, link them to the associated media file, and then have that work right alongside and give the closed captioning to the media within the course itself. We've also removed the need um, for learning designers and faculty to manage a lot of the aspects of copyright and transcription within the course by allowing them to actually associate that information in the media server, they no longer have to think about it in the course content itself. We've also added a tagging system to this so that there is easy uh, search and retrieval of all the media assets and we have the ability then to go through and, and look at each of the courses and how many media assets are associated to each one. And then finally, providing a, a lightweight project management tool through um, what we're calling a virtual media request form where an instructional designer will request a piece of media to be created. Uh, that information will then get transferred over to the media department. They will uh, implement that form and, and uh, create the media asset, in which case then it can come back for review to the learning designer and that is streamlined that process. So if we look at the workflow of the ELI media right now, right now we would op upload an ELI um, a file to ELI media. Uh, you can see the kind of the orange blocks there on the left hand side adding copyright information and adding tags. Those are required pieces of information in order to even upload it in and that helps us assure, ensure compliance in those areas so that a piece of media can't be sitting there without that information. Um, and then once those, those pieces of information have been put together, we assemble them into a playlist, galleries, or put themes around it that would then get embedded into the course content understand how to associate and create. So why did we pick Street Play Media? Well, first of all, um, we, we had 778 videos, 184 audio files. To date, we've transcribed 203 of those files, which equals about 42 hours of, of video. Um, we did a test ourselves. I mean, they have a high, high percentage of reliability, uh, over 99%. We tested it randomly on 10 different files that were transcribed manually went through and, and checked to see the reliability of the transcription and came back that it was 100% reliable. Um, we did not find a single error in any of them, so uh, that has really supported um, everything that, that we've been doing. In addition, the APIs uh, that, that come along with Replay Media will not only allow us right now to, to streamline what we're doing, but in the future to be able to automate this and make it so that uh, with the future goal of being able to upload a file, it automatically goes up to 3Play Media. Once it's transcribed, it automatically comes back down and there's no manual intervention. So that's going to become a very powerful aspect of this system. And as the need of accessibility uh, becomes more important to higher education, um, this will help ensure that in a much more quick and easy manner. Then finally, there is the, there's an interactive transcript aspect that um, we aren't utilizing to the extent that we can, and we plan to use it more, but the ability to actually take a video, get the transcribed file that, that sits alongside of it, and you can click on each of the individual pieces of text in the transcribed file, and it will jump to certain aspects within the video. And that becomes a very, very powerful tool, especially when we get into um, English as second language that we found that while we're meeting needs of accessibility, we're also meeting needs of alternative forms of delivery of content. So video now gives transcription and people can kind of work through things in a different sense. And on the right hand side, you can kind of see the number of media assets we have per, um, per category. So with that, I am going to now hand it over to uh, Brian so he can actually give you a demo of the system. So, uh, hello everyone, thanks for joining in on this webinar. 
Uh, I'm going to demonstrate what's called the ELI media system. Um, we're transitioning it to a project called Elms colon media, in case you're looking for that. Um, but ELI media, you should be able to find it. Uh, all the code that you'll see here today, you can download from drupal.psu.edu. Um, and if you want to check out more about Elms in general, because you know, Keith mentioned we have a content management system component, uh, you can go to elms.psu.edu to get that information and see the roadmap. Uh, so first screen that we get when we come to ELI Media is an overview of all the media in the system. So you can see there's filtering. So I can say, all right, I'd like to select only these types of pieces of media. So I've already filtered it to video and theater 105 as an example. Uh, we can further go and d drill down into lessons if we want to. This is where we get into the tagging structure and things if you want to tag it to make it easier. Find out the fact you can do that. Uh, so if I go and I'll click through, you can see this is a video for theater 105. It says world theater. What you'll see on the page once you have one completed is you'll see who submitted it. So this is our media production specialist. Uh, you'll see what the resulting output is. You get some player settings. So if I need to adjust this for where I'm going to embed it in a course, I can do that here just real quick on the fly. And then the embed code. So one of the major goals I had in creating this system was to eliminate the need for instructional designers, you know, faculty, staff, or even frankly myself, to have to understand what object code is. Um, in fact, you know, just to see what it is that this would generate, if I click this, we can see this is originally what you would have had to write to make this video appear on the screen right here. And this embed code is the exact same thing. Now, we're working on, you know, in the future, even simplifying it further. But this is at least somewhat readable by um, you know, a human being, quite frankly. <laughs> um, so let's see what we would actually do to make that show up in the system. Uh, so I can go to Upload Media. You see I have all these different categories of media. Um, let's do video. Let's see, we have required fields of title, course. Uh, so if I start to type in a course, see it'll autocomplete. I have part 10 here. Uh, lessons, I can populate this. This is optional. Say it's for lesson 10. We have on demand or buffered streaming types. Uh, on demand streaming is technically more secure because the user is never actually downloading the file. Um, so we, we typically stick to that. It's an on demand streaming. Uh, you upload the video. This also supports multiple compressions of video. Uh, so if you have a low bandwidth situation and you upload a lower quality version of the video alongside the HD version, it will automatically throttle over based on whether or not the user has the, the bandwidth to do so. Uh, you can see we support MP4, FLB, F4B, and movie files. Um, we also manually grab a thumbnail of the video to put in there. And then the caption file is where we upload here. So this kind of mashes everything together on this form. Uh, you can do caption files and you know, add them manually and things uh, to the JW player, which is what we use, uh, or you know, any streaming media player. But it's, it's very confusing. Uh, copyright information. So again, these are somewhat for categorization in-house. But you see we also have the ability to put in whether or not it's Creative Commons. And we have the various forms of Creative Commons licensing. Uh, you place a citation here. And then there's an additional privacy setting, which is more or less to protect the instructional designer or instructor from themselves. So if I have a video that you know, is part of a larger work, you know, it's five minutes from Indiana Jones, for example, I don't want that to ever even potentially be released to the public. Uh, so by saying this is protecting the courses, and you know, if you read the message here, it's effectively locking it to our domain so that this, the little embed code would never actually work anywhere else. Uh, you can also protect to a specific course, too. Uh, we have some additional details, fields, and things. Sometimes we keep track of this. And then usage I'm going to demonstrate now. So let's go back, and we'll actually search for a piece of media. Okay, so let's go into test. All right, we'll see I have a video here. So if I wanted to embed this, I could you know, go through steps here. I see the video. I can verify it's working. And we can also verify the closed caption aspect, too.
we can jump around, and it will pick up right where the closed captioning should. And turn that off after the fact to see, you know, you can change the volume, make it full screen. Uh, but let's actually see what this would look like in a course. So this is a sample page from our R10 course. Uh, you'll see there's the video there, and I could edit, see what I would have had to do to generate that. So this is all that's actually on the page. Um, and if you don't believe me, I can hit disable rich text, and you'll see it's you know, basically the exact same thing. So all you have to do is add in this little short code, which will then ask the ELI Media how it should handle the file and generate it. Um, if you need to embed it or you want to embed more media on this page, there's a little editor plugin. And so we can jump to and say, search for video. And we'll search in R10 in this instance, because this is R10. Okay, so now I just have the R10 videos. And then I can select one. You'll see the embed code floats here. So I can then copy that. Okay, and then I come back and to my document. And we paste it in to save. So I have some additional options on our content editing interface. You know, you can just kind of ignore because I'm an administrator of the system. Uh, we also, um, while that's saving, we also have the ability to do uh, dynamic playlist building. Uh, so you can actually create a playlist of videos mashing up, you know, YouTube videos, uh, audio pieces. If you want to record from a webcam, you can put a webcam video in there. Um, if you look at any of the work that you know, I post on drupal.psu.edu or elearning.psu.edu, I actually use the ELI media system to do all of our media. So it's also a mechanism that I can use to you know, broadcast to the world what's going on here. Uh, so there's the file that I added. We can jump through that file. Um, there's the original one that I had up there. Uh, there's also you know, the ability to do artwork galleries. So I mean, this handles much more than video. Um, you know, we're going to be focusing on the video today, obviously, and transcription. Uh, but it has the ability to you know, auto auto rotate images. You know, perform transformations to them. You can assemble image galleries in here. Um, there's a it's a pretty robust, flexible system, and we're really looking to get more people excited, you know, locally and globally to try and help build this out even further. Um, this is a 100% free project. Keith mentioned it is built on top of uh, Flash Media Interactive Server, but we are investigating how we can move that to uh, Wowza or um, Red5 in the future, which uh, Red5 is a free option. Um, but just very quickly what happens with an image. So I would upload an image. I just have the image in its original state, as you can see here. So this is the original image. And then we can select various treatments to perform to the image, which are, you know, can be defined in the system. Uh, so in this case, what would it look like as an old picture? So instead of, you know, our media staff wasting time, quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, going through and processing each one of these images, to make sure that it renders a certain way, you know, putting a drop shadow, for example. Um, we can have the system generate that for us and generate in a consistent way the size. We can then embed. And because it's by reference, say that we figured out there's a problem with the media in this course, we actually embedded the wrong image or associated to the wrong name, you can come back, hit edit on this image, I can remove this image and add a new one in, which I won't do. The instructor of the course might get mad about that. Um, but I could remove this, record the new image, and that will propagate all the places that that, that image is referenced. Uh, we, I also mentioned the usage tab, which I'll end on. Um, media is also somewhat self-aware. So I can look real quickly and see this piece of media has actually been embedded on this page. So I can straight into the content to that page and ensure, you know, if I make changes to this, how is this going to influence the content that it's presented on? Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Josh, who's pretty much reached the end of this demonstration. I'm Josh Miller, one of the founders of 3Play Media. I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of kind of what we do and uh, 
what you know, kind of how we fit into this whole system. So we originally started with research being being conducted in the spoken language lab at MIT, and we started with a project to help MIT OpenCourseWare add closed captions to their to their lecture content. Our focus from the beginning was to build a system to achieve high levels of quality and accuracy for the transcripts themselves, as well as the precise synchronization of the text to the media. Furthermore, we aim to provide a scalable, cost-effective solution with easier workflows, uh, really than any other option, and that's what you're seeing here today. And finally, we've developed a number of interactive tools to enhance the experience and provide greater user control and interaction with the synchronized text and media. One of our number one concerns is always quality. Uh, we use a multi-step review process that delivers 99% accuracy, even in cases of poor audio quality, multiple speakers, difficult content, or accents. And what you see here is that there's an automated process and then a complete, very rigorous human cleanup process. Uh, so it's a very unique uh, approach to this transcription problem. And without exception, all the work is done by professionally trained transcriptionists here in the USA uh, who have been screened and trained on our system. So our goal is to make the workflow extremely flexible and ultimately unobtrusive. There are a number of ways to initiate the process, everything from a direct web upload to various platform integrations. Uh, we've actually set up a number of out-of-the-box capabilities to link a three-play account to the most popular video platforms and lecture capture systems that are being used today. And that makes it so that the captioning, the captioning a file just takes a couple of quick clicks as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a, a number of complicated steps. So this ultimately will simplify not just the publishing but also the file transfer process. So there are two pieces here that we're building integrations for. So as I just mentioned, we offer a number of ways to upload content into the system, and as you've heard from what's been described from Keith and Brian of Penn State, uh, one of the methods is our API, in addition to FTP or other methods. With the API, publishers can actually design a custom workflow to conform to their specific requirements, as you're seeing with Penn State, and there are a number of different ways to use that. This work this works for not just the file input into our system for processing, but also the file output out of the system and back to an appropriate place for publishing. You can actually pull any transcript or caption format over our API and into wherever it needs to go on your server so that you can publish it pretty much automatically. So we're essentially becoming more of just a processing engine so that the publisher doesn't have to worry about some of these other complicated steps. And finally, our interactive tools are also built on our API. Uh, so you can host your interactive transcripts and video search, so we, sorry, we can host your interactive transcripts uh, and video search capabilities, or you can host them as well. And that will be tied into the custom workflow quite easily also. So all of these pieces can be tied in quite nicely. And another tool that can be run over the API that we'll talk about in a second is this ability to edit transcripts in real time in case you ever need to make a change to a transcript or a caption file that can be done very very quickly uh, and updated immediately so one thing we found is that no matter how hard we try certain proper nouns or vocabulary can be a bit difficult to get exactly right so we've built the ability for a publisher to make changes on the fly and by default this interface lives within the online account that we provide but when you think through an implementation like what we see with the ELI Media Server, this editing interface can also be built into a more customized workflow so that, say, professors who have uploaded their content into the system can also log in and, and make edits from a simpler interface such as the actual ELI Media workspace on their own. And any changes that are made immediately propagate through to all of the output files. So there's no need to actually reprocess anything everything gets updated immediately. So we've also built a number of more interactive tools that can be used with the time-synchronized text that we create. These are in addition to closed captions and are simply another option as opposed to a replacement. 
and this is completely a choice for the publisher depending on what it is you're trying to achieve. So it's, it's, no, it's not an either or scenario by any means. Um, these, like I said, these tools use our API, and so it makes it very easy to build into to an automated workflow and into a pretty consistent, easy publishing process. So with an interactive transcript, the text is precisely synchronized with the media, and it's actionable as well. So it's a little bit different from closed captions in that way. Each word links to an exact point in the media so that users have the ability to truly follow at their own pace. They can actually click on a word and jump to that exact point in the video file. So this is extremely useful for anyone with hearing impairments, but also people who have any issues following difficult content, or if they're speaking a language, or if, they, if they're used to speaking another language other than English, uh, it really makes the uh, the process of reviewing content and finding pieces to go through again much much easier. So finally, the other part to this that's really interesting is that the video becomes searchable by spoken word now. So you can actually search by keyword and then jump to precise segments based on your search results. Um, one thing I'll, I'll mention about the interactive transcript is that this is built to be compatible with a number of different video players, um, basically all of the different video platforms that we showed before, as well as uh, platforms such as YouTube and Vimeo, Blip TV. So it's, it's a very flexible tool that automatically recognizes the type of video player when it's published properly uh, and can very easily be synced up onto a page. So we're going to take about one minute to uh, aggregate some of the questions that have come in, uh, and then we're going to go through those questions together. Uh, it'll be us as well as Brian and Keith. So feel free to ask any more questions you might have in the window right now, and we'll be back in about one minute. OK, let's begin with uh, some of these questions that have come in. <clears throat> There, there have been a, a number of questions around cost. Uh, so maybe uh, um, you guys can, can talk a little bit about the costs involved uh, in, in, in doing the transcription and captioning. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, the cost for us has been absolutely um, <laughs> worth, uh, I believe it's $2.50 uh, per minute of transcription. And uh, you know, we've, the, the value we've seen in that is um, the, the cost of what it would take to actually hire someone to be sitting here and then, and then push something at them to do something with a, uh, you know, probably would not be a, a, the level of uh, quality um, you know, without 100% reliability, the cost has been absolutely tremendous for us. So, and I think to add to that is the turnaround time. You know, we'll, we'll upload a video file, and within two days, we'll have that back and transcribed. So you know, one of the requirements with, with ADA is that a, a student will come in and make a special request for um, the need for accessibility in a course, and the turnaround for us becomes very critical at that point because the, the clock starts ticking as soon as that request gets put in. So our ability to then just push those files up and realize that this is going to happen within the next two or three days we can get that back and turn it around and, and make it accessible to the student. And we don't have to go out and find a resource to go in and manually do this, to then edit it and uh, check the quality assurance of it. So, um, you know, I believe, and I, you guys can, can answer this a little bit better, the exact costing of it, but from what I've seen, it's about $2.50 per minute. Um, and, and the value of that has far exceeded um, the, the other possible solutions for us. So, um, uh, just on the on the 250 a minute, there have been some questions about that. Uh, that's actually per uh, video minute or audio minute, so it's based on the duration of the content, not how long uh, it takes us to transcribe or caption. So it's all completely based on uh, the content itself. Um, we're, we're waiting for uh, Keith and Brian's connection to come back, their audio connection, uh, to talk about who's covering costs in terms of centralized IT versus various departments. Uh, so as soon as we get them back, we'll, we'll have them answer that question. Uh, we'll continue with some other questions in the meantime. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a question here uh, about the, how the, the transcription process works with respect to speech recognition. So uh, what we do is we have a, a unique process that involves both an automated step as well as, um, as, well as humans. And so content will go through speech recognition first, which gives us a draft. Um, and we then take that draft and completely clean it up. Everything uh, goes through a very rigorous editing process by humans uh, so that the quality is, is, is top notch. And in fact, because it's more of an editing process, the people who are doing this process are able to actually spend a little bit more time and thought on what is being said so that in, in most cases the quality is actually higher than manual transcription. Uh, we're able to catch a lot more of the difficult words um, and some of the nuances that wouldn't ultimately be caught with just plain transcription from scratch. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, uh, what media formats are supported? We support uh, JPEG, PNG, uh, MP3, uh, MP4, FLV, M uh, MOV. Um, there isn't any type of you know, compression uh, going on on the server. You can you know, add in software that just manually takes any format, almost like YouTube, um, and converts it to what's usable by the system. Uh, but we, we've chosen not to integrate that at this time. Um, there's also the ability to accept documents, and the document field you know, can accept basically anything. Obviously, it won't be transcribed, but if you're just looking at it from a purely asset management perspective, you can do it that way. Can we go back to cost just for a second? There's some questions about how you at Penn State have handled the distribution of costs and whether that's something that's covered by, by you guys as a, as a centralized body or if it's being distributed to the actual professors or departments that are, that are requesting the captioning. Right. Okay, that's a great question. Currently, the way, the way that we function is um, the eLearning Institute handles the cost of transcription. Um, the need for this and, and trying to be proactive on transcribing all of the pieces of media is, is something relatively new um, and is something we want to establish. So we're, we're trying to figure out how we can get those types of fees covered up front um, to be able to support the needs for transcription. Right now, if, if we are reactive, we have the ability to um, go back to a central unit within the university and say, you know, we have a student with a need for a disability and we can submit, a doc submit documentation to say we needed to do this type of uh, format conversion for transcription and then we can recover our costs. But that's a reactive mode right now. So we would like to see, try to figure out how we can be more proactive. And our learning designers right now are, are very proactive in making sure that courses are accessible before the need comes about. So um, yeah, it's, uh, right now we cover the costs. The, the instructor does not. Um, it is a service that the eLearning Institute provides. Another question here. In your courses, are your faculty your primary content creators, meaning are they the ones doing the electronic resources creation, or does your staff primarily create the electronic content for them? The faculty are the primary subject matter experts. What we will do is we, in, in cases where we do uh, lecture or we do stage production um, in a shooting studio, you know, we'll use the media staff to, to physically do the shoot and or get their recordings prepared so that um, then the post-production becomes much more simple. But the faculty members are the are their primary ones for the content and the information that are being pushed into the uh, audio and video files. Does uh, a captioned video add significant burden to bandwidth over an uncaptioned one? I can't say as if we've noticed a difference. It should. I mean, we haven't uh, done testing at that level, but it shouldn't. Uh, the captioned file is, I believe usually like 46K or something like that. Um, so it, uh, we haven't noticed any, any issues with it. I mean, we use the, uh, the media streaming side of the system to power literally all of our media 
know, both on our public facing websites and our, you know, our courses, and we haven't experienced any load balancing issues at all. How many programming hours were required to develop the system? I worked for four months to bring the system up and get it to a state that we could give it away to people. So I'm the, I'm the only programmer on this project. Um, it, I, I can't really quantify hours. It's usually you know, 40, 40, 60 hours a week on this type of stuff. So, um, but the, the beautiful thing with Drupal is uh, the knowledge builds on itself. So we're able to build far more sophisticated systems every time we come out because of the knowledge gained by building previous ones. I think about a year ago, year and a half ago, um, Brian kind of sat back and, and noticed that we were struggling a little bit with how we were embedding the media in the courses. And literally one weekend went home and uh, constructed the prototype using, using Drupal as the front end to what the possibilities might be. And when he came in the next week and, and demoed it to us, it was like, wow, you're really on to something here. Uh, and then we worked with uh, kind of a, a visual guy to help develop the interface. He did a lot of programming on the back end to, to make things work. And we realized that this is still early on, that this product is, is still in its infancy. And you know, there, there are directions we would like to take it, and we would like to get more community impact and involvement in this. Um, realizing that it, it is an open technology and we want to stay true to that. Um, but that the, the advantages that it can provide, especially from an instructional standpoint of, of making sure that transcription occurs, managing copyright, um, keeping the, the, the media separate from the content itself is, is so tremendous that um, it's a huge advantage for us. And if we can come up with a, an open source streaming server um, solution with it, maybe using Red 5 or something like that, then this is a, an out-of-the-box type of solution that anybody could then take and use, um, and the framework being able to be customized to fit your individual needs. Yeah, that's kind of kind of our underlying philosophy, as Keith mentioned, the separation of all these different systems and layers of the course material is also to select Drupal as a platform to develop all of these tools on, uh, because knowledge gained in one aspect, such as you know this asset management system, can be transferred to our our next big project, which is you know, a total overhaul of the Elms instructional content management system. Uh, so it's you know, a very sustainable approach we found. I mean, as I mentioned, we only have one developer for all the systems that you, know, you would ever see us talk about right now. Um, and it, it, with this system specifically, I mean, I felt that if I invested the time up front, the amount of time it could save our instructional design team in these tedious things such as, um, you know, well, we need to make sure, go through and verify that we put alt tags everywhere. Well, that's not, you know, that's not what instructional design is about. That's not something instructors should ever have to think about uh, from my perspective. So by kind of abstracting the media, you know, the images embedded in there, and, you know, we talked about accessibility and I didn't really go over this, but the images, because you quantified, hey, this image is called X, and you put in a, an embed code that isn't in the form of an you know, IMG SRC tag, then I can automatically grab that and say, oh, I know what you want. Put in the, the things that will make it accessible, such as the title and alt tags. You know, the, the little fine grained things that could trip people up is what the system is supposed to be good at catching. And then if we notice, oh, well, you know, we're implementing video. Um, this isn't tied to you know, the JW player even. You know, it, it has that written in the tags, but because it's all centrally referenced, you know, say there's an accessibility issue with the JW player, we identify that, we fix it at the EOI media system, and that's automatically propagated to all of our courses. So there's no more going through, you know, with a fine-tooth comb every time you make a little change to the media. Brian, that's great. So you mentioned that it took about four months to get the whole system up and running. Um, do you mind clarifying kind of what some of the heaviest pieces were, and maybe, you know, in this case, kind of how certainly video was a, you know, where that fit in as a proportion, as well as certainly the, the captioning aspect in terms of getting that uh, up and running and kind of how much of a resource requirement all those pieces were? Uh, sure, sure. The, um, honestly, the hardest thing to do was 
uh, talking to the, you know, the people that host the server for us and figuring out a way of getting the files to upload into Drupal and dump securely within scope of Flash Media Server. Um, I mean, this does say, you know, it's built on top of Flash Media Interactive Server, but I always try to build things in a uh, almost overly abstract form uh, with the understanding that, you know, I'm going to guess in 10 years we're not going to use this system. And in 10 years we're not going to be using Flash Media Interactive Server, and that product may, need, you know, may not even exist anymore. But so it needs to be enough of a contained framework that it just says, I'm going to push a file to X and then let the streaming server pick up and worry about it. Uh, so that was probably the hardest component. Uh, I believe we went back and forth for about uh, two or three weeks just making sure that, you know, you would upload a file. It couldn't be downloaded again uh, by, you know, someone that was crafting and figured out what the address was. Um, so there's, you know, it was more the security aspects in, in that respect. Um, the actual standard of you know, developing the short code format, that probably took about a week or two. Um, standing up the Drupal system, you know, as Keith mentioned, for a prototype, that was about a, a day or two over the weekend. Um, you know, Drupal is an extremely complex system, and it's really hard to understand up front. But now that I'm about three years into this, I can, I, I feel I can literally do anything with it. <laughs> so um, the, the images, you know, image processing, it, it's, again, all this stuff just kind of builds. So once we've built the scaffolding of the embed codes for video, now the scaffolding for the image codes is, you know, extremely easy. So uh, actually the, the webcam aspect, which I didn't even mention, this does a live webcam recording thing, uh, I added in just as a, you know, hey, we need to try this. It took two days, I believe, because at that point in development, we've gotten so far ahead of all the problems that we had in getting things up and running that now, oh, okay, well, where do I have to push the video? I already know where, how to do that. How do I, you know, integrate the webcam? That was literally the only question was how do I integrate the webcam to do the recording? Because all the rest of the framework had already been laid. So, you know, oh, generate an embed code and, you're going to render a webcam on the other end instead of a video. It, it really doesn't care for the most part what it is. It just knows it should render whatever it tells it to. When I think the advantages of, of building in that type of a workflow become um, incredible. Yeah, so you, you, you designate someone as a kind of the uh, gatekeeper for what gets pushed up and what does not get pushed up. So media gets it, could get uploaded and put into a quote a queue that someone can then approve and through the use of the APIs and the accounts, um, you know, you could literally just click and, and say, okay, approve anything that's up there now and it automatically goes up. Um, and then the other side is from an accounting standpoint, we have seven academic departments. At some point in time, I would love to be able to quantify how much we're spending per department or per course, if you will, for the transcription of materials. Right now, it's all one big bang. But in the future, um, through the, the APIs and then creating separate accounts with different APIs and automating it, we'd have the ability to keep that accounting much more clean. Hi. Um, Toll, is there, is there any way that you could give my screen control for a minute? I kind of wanted to seem to be, I've had a couple questions on Twitter about uh, the image processing? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a, a couple of questions come through on Twitter about um, what's in the system is called image treatment. So I briefly mentioned you can take an image after the fact and do manipulations to it. Uh, so the whole idea is that I take a picture, uh, you know, from, I'm thinking again from my context, I take a picture on my phone. I am really bad at image editing. So I need something quick uh, to change that and make it look, you know, cleaned up so it can be presented online reasonably. Uh, so what you can do is use the image treatments functionality to build kind of these reusable components. Uh, so, you know, here's just this, and this starts to allow, you can get into actually writing HTML if you want to, but I was asked about, you know, how do you account for context in the, uh, in the alt tags and things like that. Uh, you can actually utilize the information from the image itself. So if I wanted to, I could just write a little snippet here, and then below it, 
say, okay, well, actually, I'd like it to place whatever the citation information is because that's a requirement for copyright, yeah. And then uh, you can say resize options. What do you want to do to the image? So dynamically, I would like to scale and crop the image. I know for this course, they're going to be, we'll say 200 by 200. Uh, we'll do pixel-based. Color manipulation. We have original grayscale, negative sepia, or you can even do a color shift, which is a little more radical. Um, let's just do a grayscale. Uh, maybe this is, this, you know, of course, about the 20s, and I'd like all the imagery to really be grayscale fully. Um, light box, yes or no. You know, whether you turn you can turn that on and off there. Uh, additional special effects. You know, we can say, hey, I've had a drop shadow. Uh, picture frame, round the corners automatically. Let's just do drop shadow. Watermarking. Say that you know you're worried this is a Picasso. You've taken an excessively high resolution version of that Picasso and you put it up here. You probably shouldn't do that because it's got you know whether that might be copyrighted. Uh, you can layer in an image, so you know, a lot of times we'll layer in um, like the Elms logo on things so that it can't really be reused in the same way. Um, but you know, you lower the opacity to something like a 10, and you say put this right in the middle, and it's not completely distracting or taking away from the work as a whole. Uh, so I'm not going to upload an image for this. You can also add in some tagging for these image treatments. So let's make one called quick test or quick change in this instance. And so kind of abstract those components. So this is my sample image, right? So I have Drupalcon costume in a meeting. If I click it, it will pop it up. So this is actually the image that's uploaded. And you can see it's utilizing some of the fields that have been taken into account by that. You can always go back and verify what the settings were to accomplish this through here. Um, but now that I've added that treatment to the system, I can go into search assets. I can find an image, such as that original image that we showed earlier, and now I have that treatment here, so I can do quick change, and let's see what this looks like, quick change. So there we go. So you, um, I mean, it does take a little programming to get those things in there in the first place, such as the drop shadow, but once you put that in place, now you have an even further reusable component. Um, a similar thing can be done with the image galleries. So. I can go and assemble an image gallery, and you see I have just a real quick mock-up here. So I can add some images to the image gallery. And then in gallery, we have uh, either artist artwork, which was the one I showcased earlier, a galleria style, or fancy sliders. It's basically just a, a test. Uh, so we can make an image gallery dynamically based on the resources that we've already put in there. And those image galleries can be configured you know, more can be added, you know, if you have a programmer to do so. Um, but they can be configured to then look at and utilize the copyright information, again, to provide context, to provide legality. So you'll see it's taken the name of these, placed them there, and this would build out a list to the side. Again, I had an embed code for that, so I never need to know that it had to do an awful lot to make that happen. Okay, well, we are going to wrap up this uh, webinar here. I'm just going to put on slide with our contact information here. So I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. If you have any follow-up questions or if we didn't, if weren't able to get to your questions, please feel free to, to email us or Keith or Brian at Penn State. Thanks again and um, have a great rest of your week.